Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, IISS Americas. I'm E.J. Harold, the executive director here in the D.C. office, and uh, it's a pleasure to have everybody here in person today, or almost everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us by video, Constanza. And thank you to Jeff Rathke, the president of the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies, for being our moderator today. Uh, I've had the pleasure this week of having a bunch of our uh, senior uh, researchers in the office here in Washington from Singapore and German, or, uh, London, and uh, you'll be uh, listening to Bastian Giegrich, our Director of Military Analysis, as part of today's event. And we're, we're thrilled to have all, uh, all three of these uh, great folks to, to, to entertain you this afternoon and take your questions. There's a bunch of publications on the, on the table outside, so please feel free to take those home with you when you leave today. And if you have any questions about today's event or about upcoming events, uh, simply reply to the uh, email address that was used to send you the confirmations uh, for today's uh, event. And uh, we'll be happy to address any and all questions that you may have. So with that, let me turn it over to our master of ceremonies, Jeff, and thank you very much. Well, EJ, thank you so much. And uh, it's really, a pleasure to be here with all of you in person and with uh, all of you who are joining us for this hybrid event. Uh, as EJ mentioned, I'm Jeff Rathke from the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies at Johns Hopkins University. And we are really uh, proud to be in partnership with IISS Washington for, for this, uh, this event. Um, I will uh, just uh, say, uh, say a word of introduction for our uh, two uh, really tremendous panelists, uh, and then we will get uh, right down to it. And our topic today is German defense and security policies and priorities. Uh, I'm going to call it under the Olaf Scholz government because it is no longer a post-Merkel government. It is the actual government uh, in power in Germany, having been sworn in just today. By the way, good timing, EJ and Bastian, for, uh, for this, uh, this event. Um, so we have uh, two uh, experts with us today. Uh, on, on my left here is Bastian Gigerich. Uh, from the in International Institute of Strategic Studies, um, where he is the director of the defense and military analysis um, section. Um, there is a lot more that you can read about him in the, uh, in the description, but I think the most important thing, do you want to wave the book? Um, <laughs> recently uh, published uh, a book uh, titled Re The Responsibility to Defend about German security and defense uh, policy. And I would also point out that IISS uh, has recently opened an office in Berlin, which brings, in my view, a much needed international dimension to what can sometimes be a somewhat parochial uh, German security policy discussion. So uh, congratulations uh, on that and for that excellent work. And then here on my right on this uh, video screen, uh, we have uh, Constanze Stelzenmüller, who is one of the most prolific writers on German and transatlantic foreign policy. She is the Fritz Stern Chair at the Brookings Institution. She is a columnist for the Financial Times she is an amateur film historian, um, and uh, she is uh, just uh, all in all a great person to talk to about anything. So i um, delighted to be back with you, Constanza. Uh, I thought that we might um, have a discussion along maybe three lines. Um, the first is to talk a bit about uh, German foreign and security policy. The second is to zero in a bit more on uh, defense and military capabilities um, and, and then third, to talk about some of the very specific challenges uh, and maybe the blind spots that face the government that has taken office just today. So um, uh, Bastian, you're here in person and I'm gonna start with you and then we'll turn to Constanza. But uh, one of the things that uh, I found uh, interesting in the book as I read it, um, you identified what is sort of a central conundrum in German foreign and security policy, and that is, the disconnect between foreign policy objectives um, and military power and the difficulty in Germany to connect uh, those two. Do you see that as a, in a way, a chronic um, a flaw or do you see some indications that might change under the government uh, that has just uh, taken over a few hours ago? 
Jeff, thanks, and and Constance also, thank you for 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 joining us. I mean, with with those two uh, here, you you hardly need me, but but let me say say a few words. Uh, uh, nevertheless, um, uh, I do think um, it is a it is a actually a fundamental uh, challenge that isn't that isn't uh, just a specific government challenge, but that uh, is uh, the underlying problem. I think of. Uh, German foreign and security policy that disconnect that you mentioned and that we uh, looked at uh, in this in this book uh, the responsibility to to defend and when we look now at this new government uh, I think it is quite interesting that the responses we had from a lot of commentators in Germany and from elsewhere people who look at Germany from from abroad uh, the responses to the coalition treaty what we heard from people I thought were surprisingly positive, um, more positive than my reaction uh, would have been. Um, uh, and what I heard most often was, it could have been worse. And my question is just, why, when did it could have been worse become the standard for, for security and defense policy? And, and, and I think that underlying uh, uh, current, uh, Jeff, uh, that you, that you uh, mentioned um, uh, is, is something that this government will struggle to um, uh, deal with. Uh, I think Germans, German politicians, uh, really uh, struggle with this idea that uh, international affairs is about a genuine clash of interests, not just a series of misunderstandings that you just talk about and then eventually you get to some sort of uh, negotiated um, uh, agreement. Um, uh, and because of that, I think we are we are stuck with some of these ideas that are quite uh, prominent uh, in Germany, namely that it is uh, advantageous to have this ambivalence between the United States as our trusted partner and ally, and then China, and, and to a degree also Russia, but more fundamental perhaps than even that, um, the tendency to treat military power and power politics more broadly as uh, anachronistic residues of a world that has gone, or, or at least uh, as something that Germany can ignore. And uh, I think that is that is a fundamental problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, reading through the, uh, the coalition agreement, uh, I, I brought the foreign policy sections of it along with me today, but um, many of you will probably have familiarized yourselves with some, uh, some aspects of it. It strikes me that, you know, a German coalition agreement is a delicate balance of of internal equities and priorities. In some ways, it's a work of art. Um, you know, with with one uh, one element balancing another element. It's a little bit like, you know, one of those giant mobiles made by Alexander Calder. Um, but but starting today, you have this uh, this contraption now being put out in the wind, the rain, and the snow to see how it's going to respond. Um, Constanze, you've just returned from some time uh, in Germany, if I understand correctly. So you can bring us uh, sort of an on the ground perspective uh, on on what your uh, how you see this uh, connection between uh, between foreign policy and and power um, uh, and and what you expect. Sure. Uh, first off, thank you all for inviting me, and I apologize to everybody for doing this sort of Max Headroom sort of appearance on a screen in front of you. Uh, the reason for that is that I wasn't really aware until about two days before my return of a Brookings for a policy that says I have to more or less stay at home for five calendar days. Um, and that includes not just going to Brookings, but doing official business elsewhere. So sorry, I'm sitting at home in Washington talking to you. <laughs> um, now, on the coalition agreement, um, Bastian, I know what you mean by, by sort of uh, critiquing this, this uh, you know, it's not as bad as we thought it might have been. Um, and there are certainly things that one could can and should critique in the coalition agreement. Um, I think we can also sort of attach questions to the choice of defense minister. But um, I think there are, let me, let me try and, and do the sort of devil's advocates and say what I think is actually valuable. And it is that this coalition agreement more than its predecessors sort of embraces the narrative of systemic competition which is something that Germany and the Merkel government um, resisted doing for the longest time. 
And it contains language on Russia and China that I think no other German coalition treaty previously has done. In this clarity and this sort of determination to uh, stand up to powers on whom from on, on whom Germany is dependent for energy in the case of Russia and dependent for uh, for trade and and a great deal of income in the case of China. Um, when I say dependent, I, I don't mean dependent in the sense of political dependent dependency, but we do import just to get that out of the way, uh, gas is about 13% of the German domestic energy mix, but about 50% or a little more of that is Russian gas. So there you go. Um, it doesn't make for political dependency, but it has created a political albatross in the form of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, uh, which I'm sure you will want to discuss in Q&A, if not before. Um, I think the other, the other important element of the foreign and security policy chapter of the coalition treaty is the fact that there is a very clear commitment to NATO, to the transatlantic relationship and to deterrence, which is in its implication, although that's not said explicitly anywhere, means that we will continue um, to provide uh, housing as it were, for the B61 nuclear bombs, which um, make us members of the NATO nuclear planning group. And even more importantly, the coalition treaty does clearly say that we will commit to replacing the aging tornadoes, which are the trans transport system for those bombs. So the Tornado Nachfolger, as it's called in Germany, is, is accepted. There is, if I remember correctly, even a commitment to, to buying armed drones. The political price paid for that is the, the, the engagement to join the nuclear ban treaty as an observer, something that I've written about critically and that I think is, is uh, a, a bit of sort of, well, as if I think it's a little bit of political theater, but it is, uh, and I don't think that it undercuts our commitment to deterrence, but I think it is an attempt by the left wings of the SPD and the Greens to, to sort of slowly pull Germany and this government in that direction. And finally, there is a financial commitment to invest 3% of GDP overall in diplomacy development and, um, and military power. Um, and if you want, you can read that as a commitment to, to the 2% and you can read that as the opposite of a commitment to 2%. It kind of depends on what you're going to spend on development and diplomacy. Well, and in particular, if I would add that the word long term uh, appears in that yes. sentence, um, yes, 3% target. Correct. So yep. that leaves open the question of whether this would even be accomplished during this legislative term of four years, mm -hmm. or whether it is simply a movement in the direction of um, so but, Jeff, you know that the that the Wars, the the Wales agreement also says uh, move towards 2% and not 2% in 2024. So it's actually not in, it is, this is not incompatible technically with the wording of, of the Wales agreement. But you know, these are niceties. We all know that the 2% is an imperfect marker. And, and frankly, the way things look right now between Russia and Ukraine, um, that's going to be the far more important test of the transatlantic alliance and Germany's commitments than, than any sort of financial, you know, sort of a slate of hand. Sorry, I'm gonna right. shut up. No, you're not, because we're going to come back to you soon. Um, uh, but uh, picking up, uh, or maybe to uh, Bastian, uh, Constanza put on the table a number of, of foreign and security policy questions that I think we'll want to go through in, in mm -hmm. a bit more detail. But um, before we get to that, um, I, in particular, she mentioned the nuclear issue, uh, the, the defense spending burden sharing 3% mm -hmm. target. Um, but I wanted also to touch on one other uh, element, and that is um, the gap between the ambitions of German governments and their, the commitments uh, that they've made, including in NATO, and the resources that Germany allocates to military capabilities. Um, that's also a, a, a principal area of focus in the book. And so I wanted to take the opportunity to hear um, uh, from you where do you identify the source of that gap? Um, and more importantly, how do you see do you see movement that could help to address this disconnect? 
Yeah, that's a very interesting point. I mean, to me, there's no structural reason for why Germany spends less than 1.4% of GDP on defense. Uh, it's a policy choice. There's no, there's no, there's no reason uh, why it needs to be that, uh, just as there's no reason to say 2% is the correct answer. I mean, as Constanze alluded to, I think. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's interesting. My reaction to the 3% goal is it's, it's a typical case of uh, if you can solve a problem, make it bigger. And instead of 2%, we now have a 3% problem. Uh, because uh, if you add up uh, spending on diplomacy, on development, and on defense, Germany spends actually just under 2%, not 3%, under 2% um, uh, of GDP on those activities if you take the, the respective ministries' uh, uh, budgets as a, as a benchmark here, which is a bit crude, but nevertheless. So the interesting point is then um, that leaves a lot of room um, uh, and unless you uh, triple the foreign ministry's budget or double development aid, um, uh, that room uh, needs to be soaked up by defense spending. Otherwise, you 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 won't get. Um, uh, so, uh, and and the, the this commitment gap, I think, uh, is interesting because in principle, I think there's a relatively clear understanding of what would be required in terms of capabilities and in terms of measures to take on the defense side uh, to move the needle in, a, in, the, in, the, in the right direction, if I, if I may say so. Um, and those plans exist. They exist uh, 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 as uh, Bundeswehr concepts. They exist as commitments in NATO's defense planning uh, process and, and capability goals that have been accepted there uh, in a multinational uh, context but then the, the the political commitment to do that to follow up on those and resource them properly um, uh, financially and with political will uh, has been lacking for the last four or five years four years probably um, to, since uh, effectively uh, the the, um, the 2017 electoral campaign um, uh, and uh, that then explains that under that underlying uh, problem that we that we talked about, uh, you can have this conundrum that everybody um, uh, agrees on what needs to, needs to happen, uh, but it still doesn't happen because you have the disconnect between the assessment of the situation and the political will to work on the on the um, parameters that would change that situation. So, so I think that that is still that is still the problem. That's still. It's the problem with all the spending language. I mean, the coalition treaty is actually longer than this little book. Um, uh, uh, the book's only 150 pages and the coalition treaty needed 177 to uh, say what needed to be said. Um, uh, and it has some really interesting um, uh, language in that section that you brought here, Jeff. I mean, Constanza mentioned uh, that commitment to, to uh, tornado replacement. Yes, that's welcome. That is also overdue. I mean, uh, that has been in the works for a very long time. Um, uh, uh, and I think it is interesting that that then comes with additional language um, that I wrote down here uh, uh, somewhere, um, namely that that uh, nuclear certification process with whatever the replacement uh, aircraft will be that uh, the German government decides it needs, um, uh, that uh, uh, Germany will um, uh, you know, uh, be involved in that in that process and and uh, 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 trying to find the, the, I, I the actually, language now. I, I made a translation of it myself, uh, Bastian, yeah. um, because it struck me. It says, "We will objectively and conscientiously yeah. Yeah. accompany the procurement and certification process that is for the tornado tornado aircraft with a view to Germany's nuclear sharing." Yeah. What does yeah. that mean? Yeah, well, exactly. What does that mean? I mean, uh, there is no there is no mechanism to do just that. Um, because, you know, there isn't um, uh, because it is a U.S. certification process. Um, that's the whole point of it. To, um, to carry nuclear weapons. To, to, just carry, to, to carry the U.S. nuclear weapons um, uh, under the, the, um, the NATO nuclear sharing uh, agreement. Um, so what could this possibly mean? Well, it, it could just be Again, political symbolism to say, well, you know, we'll 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 make sure that everything, um, that our our uh, uh, objectives are being heard and and policy is is being followed. It could mean um, that perhaps the decision of what aircraft to buy is being looked at again. Um, uh, you will know that the previous government had indicated that it would buy American aircraft. 
um, there are other options uh, are available. Um, so maybe that is being looked at again for defense industrial reasons or other reasons. Uh, or does it mean there is actually a backdoor here, uh, namely when that certification process doesn't confirm to the uh, 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 objective and, and conscientious uh, um, uh, ideas of the German government, then maybe one says, well, it's not working. I mean, I, I genuinely don't know what it means, but I think it is interesting that that was deemed necessary. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't think anybody knows. Basically, how this decoupling will work. the procurement of the aircraft, which also has other conventional responsibilities, does, yeah. uh, from the the nuclear. Uh, well, role at least, that it, at least it, it, it raises that option. Yeah. Uh, so you can have the replacement, but maybe not the. Constanza uh, would like to hear your uh, your views on that. Well, look, I mean, I basically agree with Bastian. I think that um, this. The passages on nuclear participation are carefully crafted uh, to allow for being pulled in, in all directions. <laughs> in other words, if uh, and, it, and sort of much depends, as it always does with coalition treaty, on the dynamics of power within the government. Um, and I think that that is going to that that's going to boil down to two things or three things. One, the relationship or the degree to which Olaf Scholz as chancellor um, maintains the air supremacy over security policy as previous chancellors have always done and as social democratic chancellors have done, uh, often to the de detriment of their foreign and defense ministers, or in fact, usually to the detriment of those ministers. That's the first point. The second one is um, the, how do the dynamics between the executive and the legislative work? And in other words, will the legislature uh, want to exercise a co um, co decision making powers in some in some form over this kind of fundamental policy setting? And finally, uh, the third element of this is the relationship between conservatives and the strong left wings of both the Social Democrats and the Greens. Now, these escape clauses that you have both noted carry the handwriting of the left wing of the Greens and of the, of the Social Democrats. And in particular, they are emblematic of the thinking of Rolf Mützenich, the faction leader of the SPD, who has always been uh, a powerful, shall we say, break on the ambitions of conservative social democrats um, or, or realist social democrats, um, last seen on, on the breaks put on Heiko Maas as foreign minister of, this, of, of the SPD in the last, um, in the last government by Mützenich. Now, we should perhaps also at this point mention that the SPD has a glorious historical tradition of having its uh, parliamentary group um, light a fuse under its own chancellors. Um, last seen uh, when Helmut Schmidt, um, and famously with the double I double S speech in 1977, I think, um, made some suggestions for the developing, modernizing nuclear deterrence, deterrence which were ultimately followed up, followed through on. But at the same time, um, Using this as the as the accompaniment for for the NATO two, for supporting the NATO two track decision, which his party and, and the strong pacifist left wing of the SPD uh, took personally and and ended up sawing sawing off the branch on which he sat for. Yes. Um, okay. So, but if I can take um, what both of you have said, it means that the question of Germany. Um, remaining able to participate in nuclear sharing arrangements um, with the next fighter aircraft remains an open question. In other words, it is not resolved um, by this coalition agreement. No, of course not. It yeah. isn't, no. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to ask you another question, Constanza, again, because you've, uh, you've just uh, spent uh, a bit of time in, in Germany. Um, you know, in the in the previous government, uh, many of the financial and uh, you know, budgetary difficulties that Bastian was talking about um, had something to do with the fact that you had a CDU chancellor, a CDU defense minister, 
and um, but an SPD uh, finance minister, indeed Olaf Scholz, now the chancellor. Um, will this uh, change with uh, the fact that you've got a finance minister in Christian Lindner, whose party is at least uh, open to the idea of greater defense expenditure, and that uh, the defense ministry and the chancellery will be in the same in the same hands. So here's the problem. <laughs> there are countervailing forces at work here. I can't give you a one line explanation for this. It, there's two elements. Um, there's one fundamental fact here about this new government is that unlike the Merkel, the 16 years of Merkel, uh, whose principle was muddling through and doing essentially managing crises rather than attempting to tackle the underlying pro problems, this government is coming in on a promise of pushing for political, economic, and societal transformation and institutional transformation, raising the question of how do we pay for that? And we have on the one hand, the statist um, and Keynesianist Greens and Social Democrats, and on the other hand, the liberals who don't want to raise either debt or taxes. And as we saw in the run up to the coalition negotiations and then in the treaty, in the agreement, sorry, in the agreement itself, um, the, the question of transformation is given much more space and much more weight than the question of foreign and security policy. Although, yeah. Yeah. again, depend, but compared to the discussion beforehand, there is actually more in the treaty than I would have expected, than I was worried about. The other issue is that the count potential countervailing force here is that Schultz has just announced his, um, his key senior officials in the chancery. And the, he's, he's decided that his national security advisor will be Jens Plötner, the current political director in the foreign ministry, who, I think is not as strong as one would have wanted in the uh, current political uh, dispensation because he essentially has experience, I'm sorry, is in the Middle East at the UN and in Berlin. Uh, whereas I think what you might want right now is somebody who has done time in Moscow and in China and perhaps in Washington as well. Um, but very interestingly, he's taken over his state secretary in the finance ministry, Jörg Kukis, and given him the joint portfolio for economics and Europe. And I think that if a foreign policy challenge like the Ukrainian-Russian tensions right now, if you, if you define those as a challenge to the vitality, or perhaps even the survival of the European project, which I think we may have to, we may end up doing, um, then that might trump, sorry for the, the usage, uh, that might trump uh, the relative weakness of the, of the foreign and defense ministries in this personnel tableau that we've just seen. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna talk about the idea of a national security strategy, but first Bastian, I wanna see if you have any uh, reaction to or further comment yeah, on, I mean, on the defense budgeting issues. Right. I mean, I think, um, well, maybe not so much on the on the budgeting issues, because um, uh, I mean, as I said, my, my, my view is the the resources would be there um, uh, uh, if the political will was was there. And, and I frankly, I don't believe um, that it is too difficult to absorb extra spending as is not easy. I know that. Um, uh, but uh, the list um, of shortfalls uh, of readiness issues uh, has become so comprehensive over the last couple of years that there's space for uh, more. So I think that could be handled. Um, uh, uh, but uh, the, the German defense budget, just to repeat myself, the German defense budget is the result of a political decision, not of structural factors that only allow for one answer to how much should be spent on defense. Um, but I do think uh, the point that Constanza just raised um, uh, uh, is important. Ukraine, um, uh, Russia, um, uh, but also China with regards to Taiwan and other and 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 in more general place, uh, in, in a more general sense, um, I think the idea that these external powers are not out there to seek compromise, but actually um, uh, or, or integration or collaboration of some some sort of uh, 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 form, but rather are actually 
out to undermine the order, that international order on which German prosperity and security is based on, um, you know, that to me, that, that realization, that, that uh, uh, acceptance that actually this is a strategic level question, um, uh, that has to still sink in, I think. It, it, I think Constance is right. It's, it's certainly more developed than it was. And, and we noted, uh, you know, the, the systemic rivalry language in the, in the coalition treaty. Um, uh, uh, but again, um, if that is actually the yardstick for action, then the question becomes, how do you operationalize this, including in defense terms? And that is precisely where that document, despite its 177 pages, is so vague. Um, and that is what worries me. And, and um, I mean, we should probably just to make sure that we're all of us here on the panel are not misunderstood. That coalition treaty, even though it's called a treaty, is of course just, it's a political statement. It's not a legal document in, in any way, shape or form. So we'll see. And everybody deserves uh, at least a bit of time to show uh, how serious they are about, you know, about the things that they expressed before one judges. Um, but I think a lot will indeed depend on uh, the the balance that Constanza has spoken about uh, uh, between the chancellor and and uh, important ministers such as the foreign minister and the defense minister, um, uh, in particular on such issues uh, such as uh, China and Russia. Um, uh, my view, I. This is just my personal view is that Olaf Scholz will approach all of these challenges through a geoeconomics lens um, uh, rather than a geo strategy lens um, that is just based on you know experience so far from my point of view. Um, uh, so uh, that creates again that perhaps in my view at least magnifies the challenge actually rather than makes it smaller. Mm -hmm. um, let me just uh, add one observation, because we've talked a lot about uh, defense, uh, defense spending by Germany. And of course, in Washington, uh, there, has, uh, there has been, I think, a general uh, perception that Germany under, uh, underspends on defense. But if we're talking about, if we're talking about the, uh, the actual um, uh, numbers, uh, Germany's defense budget is not small by yeah. any stretch. Um, if you take NATO's tabulation of defense spending and their methodology, Germany has a higher, had a higher defense budget in 2020 than France did. Now I realize that there are different ways of calculating this, but uh, anyway, we're, we're talking about uh, you know, perhaps the largest continental uh, European defense, uh, defense budget. What you get out of it is, uh, is a different uh, question. Um, uh, and so uh, with that, um, can you say there, there is a commitment in this document uh, to, to uh, develop and uh, issue a national security strategy? Um, uh, Bastian, uh, do you, you've, you've expressed your concerns about the vagueness of the coalition agreement. Um, do you think that uh, this uh, national security strategy is just going to reflect uh, those ambiguities or do you think it has the potential to resolve some of them? Well, I mean, I think it's important to, I mean, the idea of a, of a national security strategy for Germany has been around for, for a very long time. Uh, and, and it's an, an on, on, and on again, off again uh, type, type conversation. I think what's important to remember is um, that uh, one should not overestimate the importance of such a document, whatever it is called, frankly. Um, what it does is it codifies the, the political consensus on these questions. It doesn't normally move that consensus uh, uh, significantly. So, so um, because frankly, that's not what a strategy document is for. You know, that process leading to it um, uh, is where you, where, you, where you see the change, the document in itself then just codifies where you are. And if we, if we accept that what is in front of us now represents some sort of compromise between these different factions and the different, different parties involved, um, uh, I wouldn't um, uh, expect uh, a, a strategy document to somehow just, you know, lead to some, some sort of resolution of these, of these, of these issues. Um, what is also interesting is that, and Constanze was part of this, and, and I was involved in it as well, we've, we've had a couple of attempts in Germany to have a strategy discussion with lots of outreach and lots of uh, involvement from, from all sorts of people, including uh, friends and partners and allies uh, internationally. Um, uh, and uh, while these discussions were always very fruitful and very interesting, their, their effect 
um, uh, has been has been fairly fairly uh, uh, muted, I would say. Um, so the interesting difference now is. I don't think it is accurate anymore to say Germany doesn't have a security policy debate, which was accurate um, 10, 12 years ago. Um, I think now that debate is very much uh, ahead. Um, uh, it is just uh, that, you know, that underlying issue that we've talked about at the beginning has, has just not been tackled. And I think, um, uh, Jeff, you alluded to it in what you said, that just leads to this fact that in terms of hard power potential, um, the, the, the largest unused hard power potential in Europe is in Germany. And um, I don't think a national security strategy will change that, frankly. Mm -hmm. Constanza, uh, I'm going to put the last uh, uh, question or topic to you before we turn to our audience, uh, both online um, and our analog in-person audience here uh, in, uh, in Washington, DC. Um, and that is, uh, what do you think the near-term priorities um, uh, in defense and security policy should be for this government? Of course, there is a crisis in, you know, a full-blown crisis around Ukraine where Russia is massing forces and attempting not only to put pressure on Kiev, but also to reverse uh, its relationship with NATO. Um, uh, that is only one of, of several crises, including the manufactured crisis of the, uh, on the Belarus border with, uh, with Poland and Lithuania, and the attempt to exploit the, uh, the, the gas price um, uh, crisis uh, by, by Russia uh, to put pressure uh, on Europe. So uh, what should the immediate priorities be in your view? Okay, let me, if, if I may just make a technical point here, um, uh, we should call it coalition agreement rather than treaty because treaty is reserved for, for agreements between states. Um, but, but that's just a you know, technical thing. Sorry, I'm a lawyer, I can't resist doing that kind of thing. Um, the priority is, um, well, I mean, look, I think to be very blunt, uh, we are looking at a troop, the, the key security policy makers in this government, the chancellor, um, the foreign minister, the defense minister, and to some degree, the uh, economics minister, Robert Harbeck, uh, are all, and I'm not doing them a disservice by saying that, are all inexperienced in questions of traditional foreign and security policy. So the priority will be, um, for them to learn what this means. And I suspect that politics has lessons in store for them that will come at them very quickly. In the same way that the red-green government of Schroeder and Joschka Fischer in 1998 had to co-sign a NATO activation order against Serbia on October 12th, two weeks before being sworn into office. It had to co-sign it together with the outgoing government. Um, I, I worry a little bit because I think that while um, Schultz and Habeck are, I think, very accomplished and very shrewd politicians, and Annalena Gerbock, Gerbock I think, is gifted um, and determined, and uh, the new defense minister, Christine Lambrecht, um, was good in her previous job at justice, None of them really, I think, can be asked to know what they don't know about traditional foreign and, and security policy challenges. So much depends on their willingness to take advice from the professionals in, in their ministries and perhaps also from their predecessors. And again, that's not to in any way downplay the, the opportunities that this government has or, or their ability or willingness to learn. But it's as a situation, it's one that you can imagine authoritarian adversaries, challenges, looking at and, and trying to figure out how to exploit it. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. And there again, I would just say that in 1998, um, the, the, the NATO bombers had to be re were recalled because Milosevic realizing that this was serious, uh, made a concession. But when the NATO air war against Serbia began in, in, in March, 99, the Luftwaffe flew its first sorties in anger in its post-war history with other NATO armed forces, air forces, 
and the the, the NATO division that later occupied Kosovo after the defeat of Milosevic was headed by a German general. But I think the lesson of 98 is these things can happen very quickly and the lessons have to be learned very quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think that's a great uh, juncture at which to open it up to uh, contributions from our audience here in Washington and also from people uh, who are with us online. Uh, for those who are uh, joining us online, please use the Q&A function um, and, uh, and type, your, type your question. Please make it as concise as possible and make it a question. Uh, that makes it a lot easier for me as the moderator, so I appreciate your uh, accommodating that. And, uh, and while I wait for questions to, uh, to queue up there, let me turn to the audience here. Um, so, um, gentlemen in the second row, please uh, give your name and affiliation. A microphone is right there. Uh, Michael Mosetic, uh, you've mentioned Serbia, but an old Washington hand like myself thinks of a new government coming in and being almost upended. Now, the analogy isn't exact, but it was the Bay of Pigs. That was something they brought on themselves to an extent. Uh, Ukraine seems a lot more pressing and dangerous than Serbia. Is the newness of the government going to be a, be in a, a part of, of this outcome? Okay, let me take also one question here from the gentleman in the first row. Thank you. Nigel, Nigel Davis, I'm a senior fellow for Russia and Eurasia at the IISS, only based in London, my excellent colleague Bastian here, uh, and also editor of Strategic Survey. It's also nice to see Constanza with Twitter friends, I think. Um, so good to see you, at least on the screen. That's rather, all that matters these. Rather than just read you on the screen. Yes, yeah, so uh, with my Russian uh, glasses on, as it were, I have to ask a question about this. We've been discussing in, as it were, uh, abstract terms, I can put it like that, or, or, or generic terms, perhaps, uh, defense uh, and security uh, priorities. Um, is it fair to say that uh, really, more than anything else, a German defense and security policy now is a Russia policy? Yes, there's China as well, of course, but in terms of geopolitical threats in the neighborhood, it's ultimately all about Russia. So to inject, as it were, some substance and detail into the discussion, is it possible to offer any thoughts about coalition thinking on Russia to the extent that that affects its security uh, policy and thinking? And is there, for example, a particular social democrat sort of problem or issue when it comes to uh, Russia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I think those are two questions that fit nicely together. Uh, Bastian, let me turn to you first. Yeah, let me let me start uh, to uh, let me try and begin to answer answer these questions. Um, I should, you know, just one step back though. Um, I think one of the priorities for this new government uh, will be a is actually a communications priority um, because part of the problem is that many political leaders in Germany up until now have tried, and in my view, unnecessarily so, tried to shield the German electorate from what Laurie Friedman once called the dark side of the strategic imagination. Okay, and that, that is no longer necessary. Um, uh, uh, and I think, um, uh, so, so a more uh, direct and uh, uh, dare I say, honest debate about these challenges uh, with the German electorate, I think, would already help uh, uh, us to move on uh, a little bit. Um, uh, public opinion um, uh, is what it is. Uh, but if you are a political leader, you have the option of leading public opinion. So so um, uh, that should probably feature a bit more strongly. So on the on the defense um, specifics and 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 Russia, um, I think the uh, uh, idea of what has been discussed uh, within the German armed forces and uh, by Germany within the NATO context uh, is indeed very much uh, focused on, on Russia. Uh, and if it were implemented and fully funded, it would make uh, uh, Germany uh, and in particular German land forces uh, a significant element of the conventional defense of NATO on its eastern flank. Now, you now can have a debate about isn't that a role that Germany should actually uh, embrace and wouldn't that be useful um, if there was a conversation that said this is why we have armed forces and this is their main 
function in this context of, of NATO? I personally think, yes, that would be helpful uh, in part because it is not something that France is interested in doing. Uh, I would argue it is not something that the UK is able to do anymore uh, because uh, it has uh, become smaller in that department. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, and that of course means then flip side uh, that the, the more far reaching, dare I say global footprint uh, uh, will be a lot smaller. But I think that is the right set of, of, of priorities. Um, uh, now, uh, in practical terms that have been uh, offered up for discussion, uh, it would mean uh, rebuilding German land forces up to three combat capable divisions with eight to 10 uh, uh, digitized and uh, combat capable brigades. Um, and if we look at what has happened, uh, uh, the, that's just a, a, a large delta between um, uh, the money and effort you would need to put into uh, that to, in order to achieve it by the end or the, the beginning of the next decade um, uh, compared to what we're seeing. So I think, again, Nigel, I think, I think the idea of what would need to happen is actually pretty clearly articulated um, and, and even coherent. Um, there's even a price tag um, uh, and, and that's all available, uh, uh, but uh, we don't have the political decision to then, to then, to then implement that. So that's a disconnect between, between the defense strategy as defined by uh, people in the armed forces and the defense establishment, so to speak, and then the broader uh, political uh, uh, leaders of that previous government. And from what I can uh, tell, even though it's been only a few hours, uh, this, this, this new government. Constanze. The two questions here, um, what would the defense strategy need to look like and one and, and the Russia question. Um, the problem with German defense strategy is, is that the parameters keep changing in ways that are rather alarming to anybody who wants to rein in the German defense budget. Um, you've got the, the Russians and the Chinese, you know, overtly threatening kinet kinetic challenge to, to alliance interests. Um, and that's territorial sovereignty in Europe and freedom of trade routes in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, you have Brexit, which doesn't exactly complicate relations with Britain, even in NATO. You have populist governments within NATO uh, that have uh, a warmth of relationship with Beijing and Kremlin and the Kremlin that isn't exactly conducive to intelligence sharing. I'm obviously talking about Hungary and Poland, Hungary more than Poland in terms of the relationships with, with, with Russia, certainly. Um, and you are talking about an America that um, is discussing a reduction of ambiguity in its nuclear posture that would have implications for the European, um, the, 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 the British and the, and the French nuclear posture, and by implication for the way that Germany backs up this posture conventionally, right? At the same time, you have a an, an even more powerful development, which is the, the fact that all military kit these days is, has, has an electronics component to it. Um, and there is a di differential in, in, ele uh, in electronic defense innovation between America and Europe that is almost unbridgeable. And that makes it incredibly difficult for European armed forces to supply even in, a, in the case of a small to medium sized crisis to supply their own backbones and their own even boutique capabilities in a credible way. All these elements make it incredibly sort of complicated for Germany to define its own defense posture. But if we sort of boiled it down to one, to, to one key element, it would be that we are going to be in a position where increasingly we have to provide the, the force backbone for small to medium sized operations in the absence of American support for completely credible and acceptable reasons on the American side. Um, and perhaps in the absence or in, in, in the, in, with a reduced nuclear deterrent on the American side. That, 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 that much more than the question of whether we're gonna contribute 2% of our GDP or not is the challenge that we stand before. That is what the next German defense minister needs to understand. 
And I think she would be forgiven for, for saying, you know, this is appalling, I'm gonna resign, I'll do something else. Um, <laughs> now, on the question, on, on, on the question of Russia, there is, Nigel, I think a, a sort of cliche view that sort of the, the SPD or Putin Fersteers and the Christian Democrats and the Liberals are not, and the Greens. Um, I'm sure you didn't mean that, but it's out there, so I will speak to it. And, and I will say that the Russians have made shrewd investments um, in, uh, in people in Germany, and they have made investments, I think, in almost all the parties, it is thought, um, whether directly or through proxies like Azerbaijan. Uh, the CDU Azerbaijan co uh, connection has been much written about. Um, but the Russians have, as they often do, overplayed their hand, not least with you know, murders in broad daylight in, in the tear garden. And this kind of thing has, has I think, uh, woken up the German public, has genuinely hardened public attitudes to Russia um, and, uh, and uh, policymaker attitudes and politician attitudes to Russia, I think hardened with, in my view with the Georgian Russia war in 2008 and then with Crimea. And so I think that among the social Democrats you will not find, except for you know, the, odd, the odd sort of retired chancellor exception and maybe one or two more people, you won't find that many these days willing to engage in a defense of, of Putin's machinations or, or taking his tanks for walks on the Ukrainian border. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, let's take another round here in the room. Um, further, um, yes, David. So, hi, David Gordon, double I double S. Um, the the issue of um, Nord Stream two has been brought up explicitly by the U.S. Uh, what will what will the stance of the new German government be on the relationship between Russian behavior on the Russia-Ukraine border and the further implementation and bring to bringing into function Nord Stream 2. Okay, um, uh, Constanza, we'll start with you. Sure, well, I mean, you, David, hi. <laughs> I can't see you, but I, can, I recognize your voice. Um, <laughs> This is all completely ridiculous. Everyone's wa everyone is waving at your TV screen here, Constanza, um, to, to greet you. <laughs> it is utterly ridiculous. I am so sorry. Um, but those of you who are avid FT readers um, will know that uh, there is a, a story a couple of hours ago in the FT saying uh, Germany, title, Germany eyes Nord Stream 2 sanctions if Russia invades Ukraine. Um, the only coalition party that's been really clear on this has been the Greens. Um, Schultz has been ambiguous, but ambiguous means that he has sort of, you know, trailed like a, like a sort of lace handkerchief, the possibility of in, including Nord Stream 2 in sanctions against Russia. And, and again, because, because of the sort of outrageousness of, of Russian rhetoric and behavior recently, which has in my, and I, and I talked to a lot of people in Berlin about this, uh, which really has Berlin policymakers deeply alarmed. Uh, I, I think that that's not off the table at all. Um, the question is, you know, whether it resolves the issue and, and the question is also, as I was saying earlier, I mean, to me, you know, the, the real question is what's the status of our gas storage capabilities and what's the status of our reverse flow capabilities, would we be able not just to fill our gas storage facilities, some of which are in private hands and I regret to say in Gazprom hands, um, against both a harsh winter and the need to supply Eastern European EU and NATO members and perhaps even Ukraine um, on this basis. And I'm, and I'm not sure we have either the control or in fact, the, in, the, the necessary 24 seven information to be able to do that. And one of my suggestions in Berlin has been that we change that very quickly. Bastian, North Stream 2. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with, with uh, Constanza on, on, on this one. I mean, but, but I, would, I would say, um, uh, here's a chance to reverse a misguided policy that has been misguided for too long. And here's an external reason to do that. So you can even, so you can even do it in a politically uh, uh, a suitable way. Um, I worked for the German government for a number of years and I never understood then 
uh, uh, why the line was, uh, this is purely a commercial uh, 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 project, um, but then government is running around defending that commercial project. So it's obviously, that, that never made much sense to me. So I think I would take, if I were in the new government, I don't know what they will do, but if I were there now, um, uh, I would say, let's take this opportunity and, and change a misguided policy. Um, uh, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Jeff, may okay. I add something here? Please. The issue, the issue with Nord Stream 2, of course, was always that the German government was terrified of multi-billion euro um, uh, damages payments. Uh, German courts take um, eminent domain actions by the government very seriously. And, and of course, there is legal precedent in the form of the eminent de domain suits brought against the German governments after Mer Merkel canceled uh, German nuclear power uh, participation after, after the Fukushima disaster. And the attraction of having a Russian manufactured crisis uh, would be that you could then inv invoke force majeure um, and the, um, as we say in German, Wegfall der Geschäftsgrundlage, the um, uh, obviation of the legal basis of the agreement um, without having to pay damages. Mm -hmm. and, and the mechanism for that would be EU level sanctions, um, correct? I think so. I think that would be the most elegant way of doing this, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have uh, come to you in a moment, but we have one question from uh, an online uh, viewer, and uh, and that is, um, you know, now with the CDU CSU in opposition, uh, who will be the leading voices um, on uh, on the government on the new government's policies uh, from that quarter? Um, again, I'll start with you, Constanza, because you've you've just returned uh, from Berlin. So you mean the leading voices on, on articulating defense and security policy? Well, I think the question was interpreted perhaps a little more broadly than that, but I think let's, let's start with, uh, with, with foreign affairs, but then maybe you want to comment on the CDU leadership succession as well. Right. Um, well, you know, I, I, there, there are a lot of um, sort of, at this point, quite seasoned foreign and security policy experts in, in the Bundestag. Um, and some of them have just been pulled in the min into the ministry as parliamentary state secretaries. And I won't bore you by listing all the names, but, but there is substantial expertise there. Um, and I'm actually not worried about, like, like, like Bastian, I think the, the substance, the quality of the debate has been greatly improved. Um, I think that, and then there is always, of course, uh, the redoubtable uh, Reinhard Butikofer in the European Parliament who is the, as it were, shadow foreign minister in for any government in Berlin. Um, <laughs> and so I think there will be, you know, no lack of, of sort of substantive contributions. I mean, I, I, do, I do think that we are looking at sort of the key actors that are relatively inexperienced or have excellent experience, but on other topics. And, um, but I also like, like Bastian think that, that part of what's happened in, within the last decade in Berlin is that the sort of silos between the foreign policy decision makers and think tanks and academia have been much reduced and there's much greater willingness to talk to each other, listen to each other, advise and discuss. And, and so I think that there is, um, I'm, I'm not that worried. What about on the CDU CSU side? Uh, yes, sorry, there, on there, the CDU the transition CSU side, going on. I think the question again is who becomes the leader right now? Um, I, I sense that Friedrich Merz appears to have reviewed the reasons why he did not make it the first two times. <laughs> um, and because of this, <laughs> sorry, but I can see him snorting. Uh, we probably feel the same way about this, but uh, he, he now, for example, is uh, willing to share the stage with women, which is a really quite a radical departure for him. And uh, so I think that, that Mertz right now probably stands the best chance of making it. And um, again, the CDU has a lot of really good foreign security policy experts. Norbert Röttgen. Um, there are, I mean, th there's really no, no lack there. Um, Mertz sort of perhaps a little bit like Schultz, you know, does think quite highly of his own analytical capabilities. And that is both a strength and a weakness. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll take one last uh, uh, question here in the room. 
Thanks so much. Um, Lin Kwok, um, I'm the Shangri-La Dialogue Senior Fellow for Asia-Pacific Security and the co-editor of the Asia-Pacific Regional Security Assessment. Thank you both. Um, excellent um, presentations. Um, my question um, relates to uh, China, of course. Um, the new government is widely expected to um, to harden its rhetoric on China, on you know human rights, on democracy. Um, what sort of tools can we expect them to employ uh, to back up this rhetoric um, in terms of um, concrete actions? Thank you, Bastian. Thank you, um, Lynn. Thanks for the for the question. Uh, if I if I just may go back to where Constanza just well before before I answer this one. Um, Constanza, you, you will have noticed that both you and Friedrich Merz did a blurb for this book, um, uh, so you have more in common than you think. Um, uh, but uh, um, <laughs> but uh, I think, I mean, to, to underline a point that Constanza made earlier, but bring it to the question that was asked, I think the most effective opposition to a Scholz-led uh, government will be the SPD. Um, uh, uh, you know, from day two of his chancellorship, I will predict um, uh, uh, that will become uh, uh, more and more uh, apparent that that the divisions within that party will need a lot of attention, and that will that will be um, uh, something that will uh, uh, influence policy uh, to to uh, um, perhaps a greater degree than critical uh, commentary from the. Uh, uh, opposition in parliament uh, might on, on some um, instances. On China, um, so I think obviously that's a really um, uh, good and, and important question. Uh, I think the challenge will be if you, if you want to make this meaningful, um, you would need to convince not just the political actors in Germany, but the economic actors in Germany, namely uh, Germany's companies who, uh, who uh, obviously um, uh, hear the political statement, but are also saying, um, uh, well, look at the market opportunity that you're asking us to give up. So I think what the German government should then do in order to uh, set incentives um, uh, is, of course, um, to do the things that could encourage diversification in terms of uh, market access. So that is that means removing trade barriers elsewhere um, through trade agreements and, 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 and other things. I think that is really important um, because otherwise, uh, all of this will will be a bit meaningless um, uh, if you constantly get pulled into the um, uh, 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 you know the company logic of geoeconomics. Um, uh, uh, so I think I think the the government should perhaps spend quite a bit of time of setting setting those uh, parameters uh, to enable um, uh, other actors uh, that uh, um, you know that represent Germany and and Germany's involvement in the region to uh, to follow in that path that I and I agree with you that we will that are likely to see uh, from this government, which is a which is a somewhat stronger line on on China. Constanza. Um, briefly on China and on Bastian's point about the corporate interests. I mean, notably, the German Federation of Industries, the BDE, which is quite powerful, put out a paper in 2019 in which it adopted the European, uh, the European Commission's language on China as a partner, competitor, and, and systemic rival. Um, so if the, when, you know, once the BDI moves on this kind of thing, in the same way as it moved on Russia sanctions um, after the annexation of Crimea, then um, it's, it's hard for, for the rest of Germany's corporate culture to hold back. Um, the BDI in this sense is really quite powerful. And you know, in the, in the Russian context, it's also worth noting that the formerly all-powerful Eastern Committee of the BDI, the Osterschuss, uh, is a shadow of its former self. Um, I, was, I want to say one last thing about, about advice. I, I think one of the shrewder things that I've seen happening in this new government is the selection of parliamentary state secretaries um, in rather interesting ways. Um, Francisca Brandner, um, who was, before she became an MP, was a member of the European Parliament and really is an expert on European policy, was thought to, a, a, you know, a shoe in for the foreign ministry. Instead, she's joining Robert Habeck at the energy uh, and, and economic ministry, which is really interesting. Um, that, that says a great deal about, um, and, 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 and what the, the other parliamentary secretary of three is Michael Kellner, the former, the very powerful uh, former um, CEO of the Greens. Whereas uh, Annalena Baerbock at the Foreign Ministry has been joined by Tobias Lindner, 
who is a defense, uh, uh, a defense expert and more notably uh, a defense budget expert, which is again, an interesting and quite strategic choice and, and suggests that the, the main actors understand that they need a sort of uh, cross, you know, cross issue expertise to bolster their own decision making. But on China, I think, you know, the, again, like on Russia, the, the, the language and the thinking moved, you know, even during Merkel's last term to an extent that increasingly Merkel was the outlier in the mm -hmm. Berlin uh, scene as in, in, in terms of her deference to, to the trade relationship with China. I think that's, I think that move is, is not, you know, that's not gonna snap back. And certainly not based on Chinese behavior, much less on the behavior of the, either the speaker of the Chinese foreign ministry or the editor of the Global Times. <laughs> well, I think there's uh, too much to sum up there. And I know we've run over time by a few minutes. So let me just say that even before this government took office, uh, that is yesterday, when the US National Security Advisor was briefing the press, about the Putin-Biden call, uh, I think you uh, all might have noticed uh, the importance that he ascribed to Germany, um, not only in the context of Nord Stream 2, and he pointed out that, uh, that the United States had been in intense dialogue with the existing and the incoming German governments. Um, I think that is uh, a, an indication of the uh, intense uh, desire to engage that the German government is going to experience from Washington and already has experienced because Germany's role is central um, in Europe. It is the indispensable European power. Um, and in that sense, um, you know, the, from an American perspective, I think you could say Germany is the third most important country uh, in the world. And, and so I think this relationship and the ways that the, this newly formed government uh, navigates uh, and, and shapes Germany's international role is going to be extremely important. And I'm so glad that we were able to share that time uh, today with all of you here in Washington. We have a, we have a full but socially distanced room here for, uh, for those who can't see through that camera um, and also for all of those who've joined us uh, online. So uh, my thanks to Bastian Gigerich. Uh, I, I encourage everybody to buy the book. It's cheaper yes. in paper. It's cheaper in paperback than it is in ebook. I don't know why that is, but uh, the miracles of the Amazon for, algorithm. Yes, for whatever reason, um, it's it's a, it's a good read. Um, I want to thank Constanza Stelzenmuller for being with us virtually and setting the platinum standard. Um, and uh, I want to thank everybody for being with us uh, today. And thanks especially to EJ Harold and IISS Washington for uh, for hosting this event uh, and making it all possible. Thank you.